Good morning, good morning. Why don't you all stand to your feet? We're going to worship the Lord together. messed up there, sorry. <laughs> Actually, kind of forgot to sing, so I was like, I'll just let this verse go, it'll be fine. And then it was really long. <laughs> I was like, Oops. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that guy? failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you you called my name let's sing it and I ran out of that grave out of the sing it together. A God has rescued us for the domain of darkness. Let's sing it. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was in nothing. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you
this, I want you to think of 
all the breath in our lungs. We don't have to think to breathe. The in and out just happens, right? Because God put it there. Now that is a gift. Our breath, our life is a gift. And in response to that gift that God has given, we give it back to him. So I know this is singing, so giving it back to him in song is one thing, but giving it back to him in our life as worship is another thing. But let's sing it like we mean it. Ready? It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we Father God, we thank you so much that you are a God who is worthy of worship. You are a God who is so good and so kind to us. God who is greater than our mistakes. A God who is greater than anything that the world, anything that the devil can throw at him. God, we thank you that you are so powerful, so mighty, so kind. And Lord, we pray that today as we continue to gather and to worship you and we worship you not through just song, but through listening to your word, listening to you and applying what you have for us in our lives. And God, we pray that we would continue to worship you through not just today, but through all our lives. God, we thank you. Would you speak mightily through Pastor Chris today as he comes before us to, to bring your word? God, would you continue just to reveal yourself to us? Thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. If, if we haven't met before, my name's Mark Green. I'm one of the directors here at City Walk Church. And um, man, I just love that song that we just sang, Greater You, Lord. Right at the beginning, it says that you restore every heart that is broken. And I'm thankful for that restoration in my life. And I know that I want that for all the people that I'm connected with, that live here, my family, my friends, my neighbors, and City Walk. We want that for our community. And that's why we're getting ready February of next year to plant a new City Walk campus over in Yuba County. And it is. It's something to be excited about. And one of the first things that we're going to do to get ready for that is we're doing an interest party, which is where we tell the community what we're, what we're here for and how they can get involved. And so at the end of August, we're having our first interest party. And so just this last uh, week, a couple of our pastors met with one of the businesses in town there, and we've got a location to host that party. And so it's because of your generosity when you give through City Walk Church that we can do these things to prepare to launch this campus so that we can love our community even better. Now, if you're a first time guest with us, we're really thankful that you're here today and we don't want anything from you. Um, if you're if you're family, there's two ways to give as always. You can go in the app or online, or you can give in the offering box in the back. But if you're a guest, if you would do us a favor and grab the connect card that's right in front of you in the back of the pew, fill that out and bring that to the next steps table, and we actually have a gift for you. We'll give you a $5 gift card to either Dutch Bros or Steel House, and then we also donate $5 to a local organization in town called A Woman's Friend. And... Um, Another way that you can get connected is to download the CityWalk app. So if you if you don't have the app already, go into your device's app store. We're on both Android and Apple. Search for CityWalk Church, and you can download the app. The app's really great. We have sermon notes that we put in every week, so you can follow along with the message. There's an announcement section, which is really, really useful. If you've heard one of the announcements on Sunday, and then you got so busy, and then you forgot what time is this thing, or where is the address for this thing, go in the app. Look in the announcement section. We have all of the details for all the events throughout the week there. And so now Pastor Chris is going to come in just a second with our next message in the Letter from John series.
Morning. 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 Those of you that are watching online, we're glad that you're with us as well. I hope that you had a really good uh, 4th of July week. I know our family, we, uh, like you guys, celebrated Independence Day this past Tuesday, and our dog got really scared, probably like your dog did, all the traditions of July 4th that you have probably with your family. Uh, but we had a really good time. Uh, and then in our family this week, we had a few other things happen. Uh, on Friday night, uh, I took my daughter Julia. We, she and I traveled down to San Francisco, and I put her on a plane, and she traveled from San Francisco to Bermuda uh, to be on a mission trip. And Lori and I, my wife, we met super excited when we found out that Julia had an opportunity to go on a mission trip. Man, we were so excited for her, excited about what God might do in her life while she was there. But what we weren't excited about was the fact that our daughter had to fly from San Francisco to Bermuda all by herself. I, I remember literally driving home uh, on Friday night thinking, am I like the most awful dad in the world? I was having this debate. I just put my daughter on a plane and basically said, good luck, go into another country. Uh, <laughs> is she going to be okay? She obviously made it. But you know this, if you're a parent... Uh, over the last couple months, and you would have done the same thing, we, knowing Julia was going to travel, we kind of started coaching her up on, hey, here's some things to be ready for, here's some things to focus on, Here, here's some things as you travel, and just kind of trying to get her ready. But then, on the way to San Francisco, that coaching went to a whole nother level. Uh, it was, all right, Julia, it was that, you know, you've had these discussions, the, hey, if you haven't listened to me once in the last two months... Here's the two things you need to remember. Here's the things you, you got to remember. And it was kind of the, hey, the, the, the test is about to come. And so here's the key points you need to remember to be ready for the test. And you probably have, you, you've been on one side of a conversation like that. Maybe you were on a side of a conversation and you were that person that was the teacher, the parent, the coach. That was saying, okay, hey, if you, if you haven't remembered anything, like here's the one or two things you really need to remember to be ready. Or, or maybe you were the oh, kind of on the other side and you were the, the receiver. You were the one that somebody said to you, hey, stop messing around. Listen very carefully to me. Here's the things you have to remember to be ready for the test. Here's the things you have to remember to be ready for the big game. And, and you know this, just like I do, especially if, maybe if you're an athlete or if you've played athletics. For instance, if you're a football player, the things your coach says to you during summer practice, they're important. And you listen and, and you take them seriously. But the things your coach says to you 10 minutes before you run out on the field to play your rival in a championship game... That conversation takes on a whole nother level and the focus on and the, the listening and, and really trying to take in what they say, it's just a whole nother level. Because, man, it's, there's something about those last conversations, about those last words before the project starts, before we run out on the game, the last review before the final, that, man, those last words are important and we lean into those. Over the last few weeks, we have been walking through a letter by a guy by the name of John. And John's a guy that, man, he desperately wanted to see the people that he was writing to enjoy and really flourish in their relationship with God. And, and if you read through this letter of John, and if you've been with us throughout this last few weeks, you, you found out that John, man, he's a pretty straight shooter. Like he says it like it is, and he has a few big subjects that he talks about in this letter that he seems to like talk around him. He just keeps coming back to some of these big subjects. But now he's about to put the pen down. He's about to press send on the email. Not really, because they didn't obviously have computers. He's about to put the letter in the mail. He's about to send it. And, and he's writing a, a few words right at the end of the letter. And he's taken all the things that he's talked about. And he's having that, hey, if you don't remember anything else I said, 
here's what's most important. He's having that conversation with the people that he's writing to. And so if you have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen or it's in the app. Look at 1 John chapter 5. As John, this guy that was a great friend of Jesus, he was one of Jesus' disciples, he's now towards the end of his life, and he's writing this letter that is going to be circulated around several different churches that have started, and he's really using his last season of his life to try to encourage and help these young churches that are spread all through Asia Minor. He, as he writes this letter, before he puts the pen down, before he sends it, he writes what we're going to read today. Look with me at, at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. He says this. He says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. He says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, here's what he's saying. Everyone who believes that Jesus is God and everyone who believes that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one sent to save us from sin. Everyone who believes that, he says, is born of God, is a child of God, is adopted into God's family. And then he goes on and he says this, and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. So, so if, you, if you love God and if you believe in Jesus, something that will naturally happen is you're going to love your father, but you're also going to love your brothers and sisters. You're going to love the other people that are, are, are in the family with you. And he goes on in, in verse 2 and he says this, as he's writing these last few thoughts to these people that he loves dearly and he wants to see them flourish in their relationship with God. He says this is how we know that we love God, God's children. When we love God and when we obey his commands. John says, hey, here, here's how you know if you really love your brothers and sisters. He says, if you, if you really love your brothers and sisters, you are going to obey the commands of your dad, your father. And to these people, they, they're... they're the context and kind of what they've kind of grown up with, they're probably saying, whoa, 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 whoa. John, you're, you're talking about loving God and loving our, our brothers and sisters. We get that. Now you're pulling in this, you're kind of coming out of right field with this, obey the commands. And, and, and for these people, they had grown up in a system where they literally had hundreds and hundreds of laws that they were to keep there were all these boxes they had to check and, and like all these things they couldn't do, all these things they had to do. They had to do it exactly right. There was the religious leaders of the day that were kind of the ones pushing these hundreds of laws were all about the outside appearance and they competed to see basically who could keep the laws best. It was just prideful, arrogant, shallow legalism. And so John says, hey, if, if you're going to love God's children, here's how you're going to know it. You're going to obey God's commands. And for these people, they might like have got a, like a little twitch, like a tick when they start thinking about commands and the legalism that they thought they were getting away from. But here's what John was talking about. John was saying, you know what, hey, no, 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 I'm not talking about the hundreds and hundreds of laws that you grew up trying to keep that nobody could ever really keep. He says, actually, let me tell you about a little conversation I had with Jesus. Let me, let me tell you about something I heard Jesus say one day, and you'll understand better what I mean by commands. You see, in Matthew 22, someone came up to Jesus, and John was probably right there. And one of those proud religious leaders came up to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, out of the 400, 500 commands, hey, buddy, which one's the most important? And here's what Jesus said. The question was, Teacher, hey, which command in the law is the greatest? And they actually asked Jesus this to kind of try to trap him. In his words. But obviously Jesus is a little smarter than them. And so here's what Jesus said. And this is what John is referring to when he talks about commands. Jesus said this. 
He said, Here, here's the greatest. Here's the most important one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And then he goes on and he says this. The second is like it. The second kind of just, they kind of go together basically. And he says this, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, what's the most important command, man? If I'm trying to, to keep the list, to stay good with God, like if I'm trying to keep all these four or 500 commands, what's the thing that's like most important? What's priority one? And Jesus basically says, you, you can put the list down. Because basically all of the things that you learned as a kid, all those rules and laws, it's really wrapped up in two big things. Love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, Jesus says, hey, if you focus on these two, kind of the rest will take care of themselves. And so as John's talking to these people and he says, hey, if you're going to love God, you're also going to love your brothers and sisters. And, and one of the ways that you're going to really know if you love your brothers and sisters is if you are embracing this command to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something really audacious that some of you have not experienced, and it might be why you actually walked away from the church for a little while. He says this, and his commands, they're not a burden. Whoa, 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 John, are you telling me that the, the rules and the laws and all the stuff we're supposed to do, like, like that's not burdensome? That's not what I've experienced with religion. I've actually experienced the opposite. I've experienced that, that it is a burden. Over here, I have an extremely large backpack that has a paddleboard in it. So Lori and I, we got a paddleboard. Our Lori did, actually. I think I'm the one that bought it for her, actually. Uh, a paddleboard for Christmas a few years ago. And so we uh, left it in our garage for like a year and a half. And we actually just recently got it out to go. And here's one, a couple things that I learned that have nothing to do with the illustration. Paddle boarding is harder than it looks. And there's definitely some funniest home video videos of me that I hope my wife never shows you uh, of, of my, me trying this thing out. But, but when, when you think about religion and you think about keeping the commands, maybe like some of the people John was talking to, this is what you think of. Like, like you think of this, like you think of, okay, if I'm going to do the God thing and I'm going to try to keep the, do the deal, it's going to be hard. And there's going to be all this stuff, uh, the list of things I, I need to stop doing, the list of things I need to do, the, the, the things I need to do, you know, the things I need to read, the, you know, all, basically if it's fun, I have to get it out of my life forever. And, and that's maybe how you were brought up. It might be why you even walked away from the church. And so when you hear somebody say that the commands of God are not a burden, you would say, wow, whew, not what I've experienced because for you, following God is a lot like wearing this thing every day of your life. It's, it's carrying around this heavy, oversized burden that affects everything that you do. But yet John is saying, it's not a burden. And he goes on and he, he, he unpacks that a little bit. He says, his commands to, to love God and love others are not a burden. And he says this in verse 4, because everyone who has been born of God, everyone who has been adopted into God's family, conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. This is the reason that you have victory. This is the reason that God's commands are not a burden. It's not because you're a good person. It's not because of your skill set. It's not because you keep all the rules. He says, the reason your faith isn't a, or the reason his commands aren't a burden are because of your faith. 
your faith in Jesus, your belief, your desperation for Jesus, that's what makes this thing not a burden. It, he didn't say that life wouldn't be a burden. He didn't say that things in life wouldn't be hard and even tragic. But here's what he says, that keeping God's commands, loving God and loving your neighbor, this should not be a burden if you have God living inside you. And that's what he's saying. And again, he's writing to these people that he loves so dearly, and he just wants them to to catch these last few things before he signs off and actually sends this letter. And what John does now is he expands because he's told them, hey, the reason it's not a burden, the reason that you have victory is because of your faith, because of your trust. But then he talks more about what that looks like. He says in verse 5, who is the one who conquers the world? Like, who doesn't want that in their life? Who is the one that conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The one that conquers the world, the one who has the faith and trust that John's talking about, is someone who believes that Jesus is God and that he came to earth 100% man and 100% God. Howard Marshall, he said it this way. I love this quote. He said, to believe anything less about Jesus is to believe in somebody who does not have the ability to save us from the power of the godless world. See, John, he was, com- com- he was writing because there were some false teachers that were teaching these people that he loved so dearly that that Jesus was part God or that God came on Jesus at different times in his life and then left. But, But there was a lot of them that were teaching that Jesus isn't God. And John's saying, man, you need to know that Jesus is God, that the faith I'm talking about that allows you to have victory and that allows you to obey God's commands, not as a burden, but as a privilege is faith that Jesus is God. That's what it's built on. And what John does next is he, he writes some things that, man, as you, if you read through it, like if you're just reading through, you're like, what are you saying, John? And again, he's, he's trying to just like nail down just a couple thoughts that he really wants people to grab. And so he, he, he unpacks it and he gives some proof. Some, some reasons why you should lean into the fact that Jesus is God. And he says this. He says, Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. What the heck are you talking about, John? John? Like water, blood, spirit, this is getting a little weird. What are you talking about? And here's what John's saying. He's like, he's just unpacking this in a logical sense. He says, he's just said, hey, Jesus is God. You need to believe that. But then he says, he came by water. He's referring to Jesus' baptism. So when Jesus was baptized, during that time, John the Baptist actually baptized him. You can read about it in the Gospels. During when that happened, a, a, a voice, God's voice came down and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Like God spoke, God highlighted the fact that this Jesus guy was his son. So he says, water, when Jesus was baptized. But then he, he also refers to, he says, by blood. And again, you're like, okay, John, you're getting weird on me. What are you talking about? Well, he's, he's referring to Jesus' crucifixion. When Jesus was crucified, he literally talked to, he referred to God as his father. He asked God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. People around the cross that were part of killing Jesus at the end of this thing, they said, surely this was the son of God. And so John's saying, at his baptism, it was highlighted that he was God. When he died on the cross, it was highlighted that he was God. And then he says, there's also the Holy Spirit inside of you that gives you confidence to the truth that he's God. And then he, then he kind of just wraps them all together. He says, the spirit, the water, and the blood, these three are in agreement. His baptism, his crucifixion, 
and the Holy Spirit that lives inside you, they all agree that Jesus is God. And then, then he, I don't know if this was a sarcastic you know, sentence or what, but it could have been. It seems like it. He says, if we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his son. It's like, hey, can we all admit that what God says is more important than what Instagram says? I mean, I mean, that's basically what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? I know you got these teachers. They obviously didn't have social media. You got these teachers. You got this dude spouting off this, and you got this, this cat over here spouting off this, and can we just all agree that whatever God says kind of trumps all that? And that's what he's kind of saying. And, and then he, he goes on and he says, in verse 10, he says, the one who the one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. He's referring to the fact that somebody that's a follower of Christ, there's something inside of them that, that pushes them to believe this. There's a testimony inside of them that, that is teaching them and, and agreeing with what John's talking about. And then again, because John's not some, one of these guys that beats around the bush, he just kind of lays it out, straight shoot, shooting here. He says, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar. So these, these dudes that are teaching you that Jesus isn't God and they're teaching you stuff that, that, that is in disagreement with what God says, yeah, they're not, that's not a good place to be. They're not good people. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. When we say that Jesus isn't God, when we say that, that when we substitute something else for what God says, we're basically saying to God, you are a liar. And again, John just kind of, he, he's like about to put the pen down. He's like, what do I got to lose now? I'm just going to lay it out. He says in verse 11, in case they didn't get it yet. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. The source of this eternal life is his son, Jesus. The one who has the son has life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. So John, what are you really saying? I mean, he, he, he lays it out. The one who has Jesus has life, has eternal life, has a home in heaven, has the Holy Spirit living inside them. The, the one who believes in Jesus has that. The one who believes there's another way or the one who doesn't believe in Jesus or who believes Jesus was a good person or a nice prophet or a re you know, really good neighbor... Doesn't have life. Doesn't have life. And then he, then he says, I, I've written these things. I've, I've written this letter to you. I, I've written these things, this letter to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may hope. No. I, I've written you this letter so that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know. See, instead of fear and confusion, I'm writing to you to help you have confidence in your relationship with God. And, and here's the thing, and you know this, whether you grew up in the church, whether you're somebody that's a person of faith, whether you're watching online or you're here this morning, we, we, we've seen this in, in history, we've seen this in sports, we've seen this in biblical history, and, and here's what I mean. We've seen the connection between confidence and impact. When you have confidence in an area and you're not confused and afraid, it seems there seems to be a connection with how much of an impact you'll have. But, but when we're afraid, when we're not confident, and, and when I say confident, I'm not talking about bragging or prideful. I'm talking about you could use the word assurance. When I have assurance in something, it leads me to have a greater impact. Confidence leads to impact in any area of life. 
And that's what John's saying. He's saying, man, I want you to have confidence in your relationship with God. I don't want you to be wishy-washy. I don't want you to not be sure. I don't want you to be confused. I want you to have confidence because when you have confidence, it will lead to greater impact. One of my favorite illustrations of this is something that we here in our state are known for, and that's the Golden Gate Bridge. Every one of us, probably in this room, several times in our life, have taken a picture from some angle in front of this bridge. Maybe you've been up here on Hawk Hill and you've, you've taken a picture. Maybe you've been over here at the, the little Golden Gate Bridge, like Welcome Center. You've taken a picture. Maybe you've done it here from the beach. But we all have. And, and everyone that, want, that comes to visit... One of the things they want to do, they want to go see the bridge. They want to take a picture in front of the bridge because it's, it's pretty amazing. But, but one of the things that I love studying is, man, when I look at this bridge, being from Florida and not kind of growing up here, it's such an amazing, just like masterpiece, such a big thing. I think, man, how was this thing built? And so I did a little bit of research, and, and you, you know this. That when this thing started being built, and you guys know how windy it is. In fact, I was just talking to, to Ken this morning. He was there in San Francisco for a game this weekend. And he said, man, it was pretty windy. And it kind of stays windy there. So, I mean, I don't know if you're the type of person that you actually get nervous driving across the bridge. If it's a little windy, it's like... But can you imagine? I, I knew a girl that her dad, his responsibility was painting the bridge. So he would paint one side one year, and then the next year he would go up the other side. And I thought, I, I can't even imagine that craziness. But, but when you think about how this bridge was built, when it was starting to be built, uh, they didn't put a lot of money and time into safety equipment at the beginning. And, and so as they started building this thing, and you can imagine, like, duh, this would happen, there's 23 people fell to their death. At the, and I don't know if like the 23rd person was the mayor's son or what made him stop and decide after 23, yeah, we probably should do something different. But what they did after that 23rd person died, they put some more money into some safety equipment. They actually put up a net underneath where the people were working. And this won't shock you at all, but after they put that net up, the people that were working on the bridge got 25% more work done in the same amount of time it had taken them before. They're like, of course. <laughs> they knew they weren't going to die. Like, they weren't holding on for dear life. If they fell, it might be a fun ride, but they'd still go home to dinner. And it's such a great illustration of this idea that, man, there's a connection between confidence and impact. There's a connection between assurance and and what you get done in life. When I'm confident in my relationship with God, it impacts several things. And what John points out in the next few verses is he points out that when you're confident in your relationship with God, it affects how you pray. You pray and you don't pray wondering if God hears you. You pray confident that God is listening, that God hears you. You, you pray for, you, you, don't, you don't pray like, oh, I hope this gets through the ceiling. You, you pray knowing that, you know what, I'm praying to a father who is leaning in and listening. When you have confidence in your relationship with God, it affects how you pray, but it also affects how you view sin. And, and John talks about it in these last few verses. It, when, when we have confidence in our relationship with God, we know that sin is no longer our boss. Like, I don't, I don't, have, the, I don't have handcuffs. I don't have to sin. We, we view sin differently. It bothers us when we see sin destroying other people's lives. We're not okay with that. And when we have confidence in our relationship with God, we don't give up on people because they went down the wrong road. We pray harder for those people. Because we want to see their lives change because we know that sin destroys them. And it's, it's one of the things that when we have confidence in our relationship with God, it impacts how we pray, but it also impacts how we view sin. Because sin destroys. Sin 
kills. Sin breaks things. Sin is powerless when it comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. And we view sin differently when we have confidence in our relationship with God. And now as John, as he's preparing to tuck that letter in the envelope, it was actually probably a scroll, but as he's preparing to hand this thing off to someone that will then take it to these churches, he, he loves these people that he's been writing to. He just he wants to see them enjoy their relationship with God. He, he, he wants them to enjoy this relationship that they did not earn, but that God freely gave them because of his son dying on a cross for sin and raising from the dead. He, he wants them to really grasp these truths and enjoy their relationship with God. And before John puts the pen down, he writes one more phrase to close his letter out. And here's how he closes his letter. It's a very unique way. He says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. You could, you could use that, that word idols. You could put the word substitutes. He says, I, I've talked to you about a lot of things. I've, I've leaned into a few really important things. These last few kind of sentences of this letter but the last thing I want you to know, the, the thing that will stop all of what I've talked about, if you don't, if you don't get this last phrase, it, it's going to affect everything else I've talked to you about. He says, little children, guard yourselves from substitutes for God. Guard yourselves from idols. And, and here's the thing. This hasn't changed since John wrote this. If John was writing to us, if he was writing to me, if he was writing to you, he could say the exact same thing and it would be as applicable today as it was when he wrote it the first time. Chris, guard yourselves from substitutes for God, from idols. And here's the thing, most likely, none of you, whether you're watching online or you're here this morning... None of us woke up today and looked in the mirror and said, good morning, idol worshiper. Like, like you didn't, you might have done that, like if my husband's behind me, I might just call him that, but yeah, no, nobody, because you didn't, on the way to church, you didn't bow down to the statue in your front yard. Like, and when we think of idols, we're thinking like the pole in the yard or the, you know, some, some statue that people bow down to and and so when you look at yourself, you don't look at yourself and say, oh, there's a classic idol worshiper. There's a, no, no, no. That's, that's not, we're, we're not idol worshipers, are we? I mean, that's not really who we are. We don't bow down to poles or golden calves, are, are we? Well, here's maybe the better question that is applicable to all of us. And it's just simply this question. Have you, have I? embraced a substitute for God in any area of your life. So maybe, maybe we wouldn't say, are you an idol worshiper? Like, no, I don't, I don't think I am. But have I embraced a substitute for God in any area of my life? I need to wait a second before I answer that. I need to think about that. I mean, instead of Jesus is God, I'm going to substitute Jesus is a good teacher. Maybe you've done that. Instead of loving others, I'm going to substitute loving others that are like me. Instead of generosity, I'm going to substitute greed. Instead of faithfulness in marriage, I'm going to substitute pornography and unfaithfulness. Instead of God's way, I'm going to substitute my way. It's, it's, see, it's, and it's in these moments. It's in these moments, and, and if you've had this, and we all have at some point in our life, we've all, if you are a follower of Jesus, there's been a point in your life where you have actively put something ahead of God, and I have too. 
And it's in those moments where we substitute something for God that what John wanted to not happen actually happens. And here's what I mean. It's in those moments when I substitute something else for God that my relationship with God becomes a burden. And John said it should never be a burden. And it shouldn't be. Obeying God's commands shouldn't be a burden, but it becomes a burden when I substitute something else for God in my life. And you know it and I do, because we've, we've done that. We, we think of the times when our relationship with God was not good, when there was conviction, when there was just, it just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of harmony in that, and it's probably a season of your life, a season of my life, when you can look back and say, yes, I was substituting this for God in my life. Or substituting this way for God's way in my life. And what John, as he, he, he closes his letter, he desperately wants those that he loves to not be burdened, but to thrive and flourish as they love God and they love other people. See, life, and, you, and I'm like this, what I'm about to say, you're not like, duh. Life isn't easy. Like, we know that. Like, it has burdens in it, but our relationship with God doesn't have to be one of those burdens. And at the end of your life, and I know this about myself, none of us want to look up at the end of our life and realize, kind of have a whoops moment, where we realize, I never embraced the real thing. I never experienced God's best. My family never experienced God's best because I leaned into a substitute instead of God. And if John was here today and he was to hand this letter to us, he would probably tell us the same thing. Be careful because you can believe all the right things, you can be in all the right places. And if, if and Satan's good, he's done this for thousands of years, he knows if he can just turn your focus away from God enough so that you begin to say like Eve said in the garden, did God really say? Did God really mean? God wouldn't want me not to have. And we begin to substitute our feelings, our ideas, our ways, what feels right to us for what God says. And it's in that moment that we are getting on a path that leads to a very burdensome relationship with God that was never meant to be a burden. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're watching online Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're listening to this this week on a podcast. And if you're here this morning or you're, or you're here listening to this, and maybe you would say, hey, Chris, I'm not a person who follows Jesus. I'm honestly maybe a little skeptical of the whole Jesus thing. Maybe you were hurt by the church or by people that say they're followers of, of Jesus. And so you kind of have kind of stiff armed that whole thing. Well, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning or you're listening to this, and if you've embraced this idea that you don't need God because God isn't good, man, the first step for you this morning, and I know it's a big step, is saying yes to a relationship with God. You say, Chris, how would I do that? With every head bowed and every eye closed, it's, it's simple. It's internally, it's, it's just admitting to God that you have disobeyed him, that you've done things your way, that you have sinned. It's telling God that, God, though I know I've disobeyed you, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay for that sin. I believe that. And then it's just... Kind of from the inside, just saying to God, God, I want a relationship with you. Come into my life. Transform me. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you'd say, Chris, I want to do that. Just right where you're at in the quietness of your heart, just, just tell God, God, I admit to you that I've disobeyed you. I admit to you that I have done things my way. I've sinned. Just tell him. And then just in your own words, just tell him. Say, God, I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave for me to pay for my sin. That he took my punishment. He took what I deserved. Just tell God. And then just in the quietness of this moment, just invite God. God, come into my life. I want a relationship with you. Transform me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if, if you're here this morning or you're watching online, you're listening to this, and, and you made that decision to start a relationship with God, we would love to know about that. If you're here with us, there's a decision card right in front of you. You just take that decision card, fill out a little information. You can drop it in the offering basket. You can drop it at the next steps table. Man, we just want to know about your decision. We're excited for you. If you're watching online, you can go to citywalk.cc and there's a card there you can fill out as well. Maybe you're here like, like a lot of us and you'd say, Chris, I've, I've already made that decision. I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a few weeks. Maybe it's been decades. Is there an area of your life that you have embraced a substitute, an idol for God's best? Are you believing something that isn't true? And if you're honest, is causing your relationship with God to feel like a burden? Are you willing to, in this moment, admit that to God? Turn from that idol. Turn from that substitute. And replace it with God's best and God's way. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe God immediately brought an area to your life. Maybe the Holy Spirit's pricking your heart with an area of your life where you are not doing things God's way. And you would have never called it being an idol worshiper, but now as you think about it, you are substituting this way for God's way. And you'd say, today's the day I just want to be free from it. So I'm going to admit it to God. I'm going to admit what I'm doing, I'm going to turn from it, ask God to forgive me, and I'm going to replace it with God's way. As we close our service here in a second, we're going to sing another song. And down front, Matt and Sue are down front. If you just want someone to pray with you, maybe for you it's just, man, I just want to come down to the front and I just want to pray and I just want to give some things to God. You can do that. Maybe you have questions. Matt and Sue will be here after the service. They're, they're available to just help you, pray with you, encourage you in any way that they can help you. And so if God is speaking to you, my prayer is that you would lean in and say yes. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. Thank you for the free gift of an abundant life. Thank you for this, this relationship that you provide to us that is not a burden but a blessing. And God, in the midst of a world that has a lot of tragedy, in the midst of a world that brings with it a lot of burdens at times, we have you. And you don't ask us to do anything you didn't do when you were here, and that's just to love God and love others. And I pray that we would never substitute our way for your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us? It's a great time for you, like Pastor Chris said, to respond. What is God speaking to you today? What has he spoken to you that you need to say yes to? You're welcome to come down front and, and, and pray or ask questions or even just 
to sit and close your eyes and, and just take a moment and respond to what God is, is pressing on your heart. Let's sing together. Oh, 
as we call grace a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you when the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are so I will praise you in the valleys of the same no less God within the shadows no less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart in the highlands in the heartache Lord and sea thank you for singing you may be seated Before we go today, I just want to give you a couple of ways that you can get connected uh, this month. July, believe it or not, is like the busiest month for City Walk. We have so many things going on. So one of the ways that you can get connected this month, actually starting this week, is city groups. And so if you're not in a city group and you've been thinking about it, now's the time to jump in. Um, if you notice on the, the picture on the screen, city groups, we have a bunch of circles on there. That's what city groups is about. It's about circling up with a small group of adults and sharing life together. It's a place where you can know other people and where you can be known yourself. And so if you're looking for that kind of community, then City Groups is the place for you. And so there's three easy ways that you can get signed up. You can go on the app, right in the announcements section at the very top, there's a button for City Groups. You can go to citywalkchurch.com, click on Next Steps, City Groups, or you can go back to the Next Steps table over here right after service and whoever's there can help you with that. Uh, another way that you can get connected this month is City Sports Camp. And so today, anybody that's on the staff team for City Sports Camp, about 15 minutes after service, we're gonna meet right here in the auditorium for our first training. We're really excited about that. If there's any way that we can serve you, stop by Next Steps and talk with us. Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>